Okay, it is finally here. I pre-ordered this adapter after its announcement at CES with the hopes of being the first one to review, unlike my usual approach. The Satoshi 200W 6-port all USB-C desktop power adapter. I will be putting this adapter through its paces to find out what it can do. I'll be checking to see if it can hold up the rated power, if it gets too hot, how the power sharing works, and how efficient, plus in general, how good of a power supply is it. Based on the performance of the 165W adapter, I have high hopes for this one. This is a big power adapter, but it should be able to handle lots of devices at once. In this series, I try to answer the question, which power adapter do I want to get? The videos get technical, so hang on, and always ask questions if you don't understand something. The performance is measured and compared to near competitors to see how each one stacks up. If you want to help out the channel, see the links on my webpage or in the description. Patreon is now live, as well as the super button. Thanks, my current patrons. Okay, let's start with the Satoshi 200W USB-C 6-port PD GAN Charger Model STC200GM-US. So, like the last one, this one has a box in a box, but it's less of a box and more of a holder. All the magic bits are in here. This is nearly an identical experience, but everything is a little bit bigger. Inside we find the power adapter, a plastic tray if you want it to be upright, and a US 3-pin AC power cord. The power cord is about 4 feet long that is supplied with it. The cord comes with a Satoshi branded cable tie as well. There is a user manual, which is vague on specifications, but goes kind of crazy with the power sharing metrics. It goes into detail on how the power sharing works with various combinations of ports being used. We will bring these back later and investigate how the power sharing works in more detail. Detail. The packaging for this one weighs 115 grams. The power adapter weighs 794 grams with the power cord and support tray. This is a very heavy adapter. It puts the brick in brick. Compared with the Ugreen option, this is about 100 grams heavier. In comparison size-wise, this is the largest 200 watt adapter I've seen. This is a little taller and slightly larger overall versus the Ugreen 200 watt adapter. The power adapter has a premium look and feel of Satoshi adapters. They decided to change up the USB port options and do away with USB-A ports. The device has six, yes six, USB ports, all C type. Around the back, we can see the ETL safety listing and a bunch of text describing the power outputs and current handling capability, but simplified this time. The adapter has the Department of Energy 6 mark on it, which is missing from the 165 watt adapter. We will see if this one meets the mark or not. I expect to see the idle power consumption be substantially lower with this claim on the product. If it doesn't meet that, then they're flat out lying. I may be leading you on with that. Should I tell you? I'll wait. The user manual has these giant tables that tell you every possible way the device can be plugged in. The power sharing it does seems to follow a basic hierarchy. The first two ports are the highest power per single port. I really just don't like the way this loses the 140 watt mode if you plug in any other device. It really doesn't make any sense at all. It still has 60 watts to spare, but nope, 100, 100 dropping to two ports. Then it has a 65, 65, and then it drops down to 45, and then 20. On the 20 watt ports, you get less modes of operation. We'll check how the renegotiation happens later on. Okay, time to plug this thing in and see what it can do. The first thing I noticed is that the idle power consumption is bad and a bit unstable. It is a low distortion signal, but it has a lot of signal, meaning watts, all the time. It is using too many watts all the time. The idle power appears to be running in some kind of hiccup mode during its idle state, like the 165 watt adapter, meaning it uses more power for a short period of time, but it is an extreme. The idle power is a little higher yet when we power this with 230 volts and 50 hertz. Almost a watt, which is really not acceptable. This is getting on charging a phone per day worth of idle energy. This is very wasteful. The real issue here is that it claims to be in compliance with Department of Energy 6 and it isn't even close. The idle power is four times higher than it should be. Even if you replace six adapters with this, good adapters will come out lower for idle power usage. If we investigate the idle power from a single unit perspective for cost, it ends up around one and a half dollars for a US household and up to four euros for a European household in a year. It isn't about the one though. Millions of people using that much adds up to a lot of wasted energy. The technology is available to do better than this, and this one went the wrong way for a brand new product and got worse, much worse. The power adapter has an LED on the face. Thankfully, it is not as bright and is a nice small LED. It is also not an awful blue color. The small, dim, white LED, just enough to show it's on. This is okay. The Satoshi has lots of modes of operation for a USB power delivery device. The current specification states normal modes of 5, 9, 15, and 20 volts for fixed output voltage that your device negotiates for. This device adds in the 12 volt mode also. Always welcome. This device can also supply the lowest power extended power range mode of 
28 volts, so this can deliver 148 watts on one port. This power adapter also has an adjustable power supply voltage mode called Programmable Power Supply, or PPS. This mode can help deliver charge more efficiently and therefore faster. The Satoshi has a 20 volt mode with up to 100 watts of power or 5 amps, but only on two ports. The other ports cannot deliver as much in the PPS modes. This does mean Samsung super fast charging is on, although Satoshi doesn't make a claim of that, mentioning only Apple devices in the marketing. Let's turn the power up on this one and take a look at its performance. The first thing I see with this power adapter is it has power factor correction, and it turns on very early. No mode segregation with this one. Based on the power in, the efficiency of this device at 10 watts is not great. It unfortunately is not doing a great job at this low power level, unlike the 165 watt adapter. As the power is increased, the device does get a little more efficient, but it does not look like it's going to be a top tier device. The power quality might be high, but it won't be the winner. The limitation of this adapter on one port is 140 watts with the extended power range, but as soon as you use a second port, it is 100 watts on one port and the distribution of power is not good. The voltage levels were good on this power adapter. Each mode held within its tolerance of the USB specification. This shouldn't have any issues powering lots of devices, as long as you do it one at a time. It is not as good as some I have seen, but it is okay. The power negotiation on plug and unplug of devices starts in a really bad place. On every plug and unplug, it turns the other ports off and renegotiates to be able to lower the power output capability of the individual port. This is like a power adapter from four years ago. It renegotiates aggressively, which with six devices plugged in, I expect it to cause issues with charging. The one situation where I found it doesn't renegotiate is the lowest power port and one other port in use, as long as it isn't the 140 watt EPR mode. I don't like the power negotiation of this device, and I find it rather archaic in comparison with even the 165 watt adapter device from the same manufacturer. The 200 watt competitor's devices didn't have to renegotiate at all with 200 watt devices plugged in, so as the power drops out, with more ports being added in, all the ports turn off. I tested this with my studio lights and all the lights turn off and on with plugs and unplugs of even just one light, whereas the other devices do not do that. The power adapter did have the claim of Department of Energy 6, which is a standard for power supply efficiency. It doesn't meet the requirement at 120 and at 230 volts it won't meet the EU requirements, at least for the idle. The efficiency does meet. It also doesn't meet the less strict and older requirements of the Australia or the California Energy Commission. Overload is testing when the device safely shuts down when too much power is drawn. This can happen from a short circuit or a misbehaving device. The power adapter tripped on overload at 166 watts when in the 140 watt mode and 129 watts when in the 100 watt mode. This is pushing the limits a little far, well beyond what the normal cables are rated for, so this could be of concern in a fault condition. The power adapter got warm, but not particularly particularly hot during testing. Power factor correction is a technique to consume AC power as efficiently as possible. The higher the power factor, the lower the comparable current and therefore the lower the loss in wires and transformers that supply your power. The goal is to have the waves all look the same shape as the yellow line, a sine wave. This power adapter does have power factor correction and it turns on early, but it isn't the most efficient design I've seen. The power adapter is in a weird place because it has great power factor correction, but it ends up using a couple extra watts to get there. Here's the detailed data for this device. This is good, but it should be better for a new device and it isn't holding up. The idle performance is a sore spot. It looks like this adapter needs a few adjustments to beat the best one. In terms of efficiency, it starts very low and it doesn't really ever achieve the high marks of the older higher wattage adapters. This power is clean, but it is less efficient in nearly every mode. This moves the power adapter up in power quality score, but the watts in and the power quality both matter. At least in 120 volt mode, this one is average. But what happens when I switch over to 230 volts and 50 hertz? At the higher voltage input, the power data changes a little. The idle did increase, but not a huge amount. And the efficiency is a little better. The power factor is still strong. This is an okay power adapter on 50 hertz, but it didn't achieve an amazing efficiency but it was of high quality, so it's still wasting those few extra watts. Okay, time to compare the data. I have a few other 200 watt adapters I've tested, so we will do some direct comparisons. When comparing the idle data with the others, it isn't as bad as the Wotobi's 200 watt, but it doesn't compare to the Anker 747 150 watt adapter, but it is getting close to that terrible Wotobi's figure. This makes the claim of DOE 6, and it doesn't meet the idle requirement. This means this adapter is lying. It isn't even close, so something is definitely funny here. This adapter uses nearly one watt all the time. When we look at this on the idle graph, the story stays the same. It isn't as bad as the Wotobius, but it's not even close to the anchor. Again, even as the multi-output 
output requirement, this doesn't meet the efficiency requirements. When comparing the overall data with other adapters, this thing looks better. It actually is a top tier performer in terms of power quality, but in terms of watts, the other part of the picture, it isn't great. The efficiency is not as high as it should be in both the 50 and 60 Hz modes. The power factor correction is active a lot of the time, giving it very strong marks for quality, but it should be better. The bar was set high by the 165 watt adapter and this does not clear it. On the average power consumption graph, it looks like it's on top, but in a line, it is using more power to do the same amount of work. They all have good power factor at the high end, so all things equal, this one is worse. Okay, well there it is, the Satoshi 200 watt power adapter. This one won't be getting a recommendation from me. The power sharing is old, the decisions made on the power sharing are bad, the idle power is too high, the price is a bit high, and the general performance is just not in it for what it's supposed to be a premium product. This adapter, although it does have high power quality, is not efficient enough, even when compared with its own company's similar adapters. The efficiency is holding it back along with that high idle power consumption. In terms of cost, this adapter is around 150 US dollars. In terms of the cost per watt, it isn't adding up to the price being charged either, so it's also not a great value. It is a big adapter, so probably not gonna be traveling with this one, but it does work all around the world if you have the correct power cable to plug it in. They did make one thing better, the LED is a nice soft white LED, so it won't light up the room blue. Unfortunately, this didn't win any awards, and if picking up this adapter, you won't either. Maybe a higher electric bill though. The 165 watt adapter is something special, but it seems like they completely forgot how to design a power supply in getting this 200 watt power brick out. The way it turns off the 140 watt port with any other ports plugged in and how it has to renegotiate on every plug and unplug is annoying and feels like an older power adapter. It looks like this one will do fine as a literal brick though. Okay, time to apply the sticker. This is tested and on the database so you can take a look at how it stacks up, sort of. The 50 and 60 hertz data still don't display correctly. Thanks for watching. Next week, I'm going to go through these Ugreen products. I have a desktop power strip adapter and a new version of the 100 watt desktop adapter. I also may have more from Ugreen to look at. Check my website for upcoming videos. There's a schedule of release dates, and I have too many more of these adapters to get through, so many more videos in the future. Goodbye.